welcome listeners to Connect the Dots. I'm Allison Rose Levy, and I'm here with you every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Radio Network. I'm a long-standing journalist of the environment, food, health, policy, the media, and popular attitudes, bringing you different authors, uh, filmmakers, advocates, experts, academics, uh, doctors, scientists, and even poets, all kinds of different people who are connecting the dots between everything in our interconnected world that impacts ourselves, our communities, our society, and the wellness and ecological stability of our habitat planet Earth. Uh, And that's what we do every single week on Progressive Radio. We will soon be entering our 10th year of broadcast or webcast or however we want to call that. I'm really psyched about this week's show. Uh, We have a wonderful guest um, who is one of uh, four actual co-authors of a book that I am really psyched about. The, The book is called A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, and our guest is one of the authors. Thea Rio Francos, um, and it's really great. We're going to be talking about this on today's show. Thea is an assistant professor of political science at Providence College and the author of Resource Radicals. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, Jacobin, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Dissent, and In These Times, and she also serves um, a, a very important role uh, on the steering committee of the um, Democratic Socialists of America's Eco-Socialist Working Group. And maybe we'll get to talk a little bit about that, as well as about this terrific uh, must-read book, uh, which has a wonderful foreword by Naomi Klein. Um, So welcome to Connect the Dots, Thea. So happy to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, You know, do you want to, uh, you know, we've covered... We've had many shows, actually, in the year since the uh, Green New Deal uh, was first launched, you know, last February 2019. Um, But for any listeners who may have missed that, um, can you just give a little brief introduction to the Green New Deal and who's been hiding under a rock, which is probably not the case for most of our very activist-oriented listeners. But, you know, could you give a little orientation to what the Green New Deal is, um, which your book is really unpacking many of the policy implications and opportunities uh, of, of, of the Green New Deal. Sure. Um, so the Green New Deal is, in a way, a completely new paradigm for climate policy. And what makes it unique is that it connects the climate crisis to the crisis of social and economic inequality. Um, for many years, climate policy was kind of highly technocratic, Um, market kind of oriented by kind of market policies to kind of shift consumer behavior or corporate behavior and um, was was kind of um, developed in in isolation from broader social problems that that are themselves the root of the climate crisis. So what the the Green New Deal does is connect um, and kind of thinking about the theme of your show is connect the climate crisis to the broader kind of social um, and economic world that we live in and develop a set of policies that attack both inequality and climate chaos at the same time. Um, So that's what what is unique about about the Green New Deal. And just to kind of give a little bit more context, um, it comes out of longstanding movements for climate justice that always saw the climate crisis as connected to broader systems of inequality and domination and lack of representation and a kind of social system that allowed, for example, fossil fuel companies to get away with what they've gotten away with. Um, so it it's yes. very much draws on the climate justice movement, which is a global movement, but also obviously takes lots of local and national forms around the world. Um, and it also very much responds to the the quite kind of scary um, uh, climate science that, that has been coming out in, in a variety of climate reports um, from various UN agencies over the past few years that make it extremely clear um, how stark um, the, the crisis is and, and what the scale of social action um, would be necessary to, to address it, uh, both in terms of policy 
um, public policy responses, but also in terms of kind of social mobilization and, and transformation of, of the various societies that we live in. Um, and the Green New Deal um, came to the sort of forefront of, of the news and the public imagination uh, for a few reasons. Um, one is that a very charismatic insurgent left uh, politician, Alessandro Ocasio-Cortez, decided to make it the kind of centerpiece of her um, of her campaign and, and her time in office. Um, and she's also, though, joined um, uh, a number of social movements who have also been advocating for Green New Deal very vociferously. Importantly, among them is the new organization called the Sunrise Movement, um, which is a mass movement of, of youth. Um, but there are also a variety of other environmental justice, uh, socialist, indigenous, um, and other movements that have also been throwing their weight behind a Green New Deal. So this is the kind of broader ecosystem in which a Green New Deal has become salient. But I would say what, what marks it as a policy paradigm is, again, that recognizing the deep connection between the climate crisis and the crisis of social and economic inequality that we live through every day in the United States and around the world. Yeah, thank you. That's a fantastic uh, introduction. And just as a, a side note, about a week ago or so, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was speaking to her constituents uh, in her congressional district in Queens, New York, and she had a, a sort of, you know, let my hair down with my constituents and my community um, events. And I went to that, and I was traveling by subway. And since the event, for people who know New York, you'll appreciate this, people, you know, I reside in Brooklyn. The event was in Queens, and actually that's probably the longest or one of the longest subway rides in the city. So I was reading this book. Uh, a Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. It's published by Verso Publishing. Um, and I had it with me, and so when the time came, there was an opportunity to take a photo uh, with the congresswoman. And so I actually I have a photo of her and me, and I'm holding the book. Um, so uh, I'll have to send that to you. But she has Thank been, you. and, you know, she actually talked about it, and because she, she was kind of, her engagement in that, um, was was really almost a shocking uh, to her even um, you know spontaneous happening after she 'd been elected and was you know visiting Congress as you know an upcoming future next uh, next term congresswoman um, you know and encountered the sunrise people in the sunrise event and they basically drafted her and it actually became the signature of um, you know, of her incredible uh, last year, it's only a year really, amazing to think of, um, year in office, her first year uh, in office. And, you know, for those of us who uh, have been long uh, beating the drum on climate and environment, as I have as, you know, one of the first reporters on fracking, and, you know, many of the listeners uh, are people who follow all, and, you know, and are active on, the, on those issues, this was really a godsend. And, you know, one of the things that happens is, and you know, right now we're in an election, um, you know, a, a year where, you know, we're entering an election year very shortly, and we've been in, uh, you know, a, a time this year of, you know, uh, nom- you know, potential nominations for the Democratic Party leadership, you know, who's going to run for president. And so, you know, there are a lot of different you know, ways, I mean, the, the climate topic has been excluded from the Democratic Party debates, but there have been, you know, climate town halls, and there have been opportunities for candidates um, to share their concerns, because most of the candidates, probably all, I would say, on the Democratic side are not in denial about whether we have a problem on our hands. Um, right. So what we've seen, and this, and this is why uh, Planet to Win is so interesting, is we've seen, you know, a whole kind, a bunch of shades of difference uh, between what the candidates are proposing. Uh, and it goes all of the way from, you know, what you're describing, this sort of technocratic market-based solutions, to the more comprehensive, holistic, um, uh, you know, look at the problem from its various interconnected, you know, sectors and segments and really design something that is a holism that fits the whole situation, which is what the Green New Deal is in terms of its policy outlines and in your unpacking and explication and exploration of those in this book. Um, So, you know, could you define for our listeners what we mean 
um, by technocratic solutions, market-based solutions, why and how they're presented, why they seem like maybe they could work, and what the problems with, it, with them have been and would be going forward if we adopted that avenue of approach. Yeah, sure. And and I'm I'm I, I like the way that you frame that and I'll just sort of join some of the things that or underline some of the things that you said about, you know, on the one hand climate denial, um on, you know, especially from the Republican Party. On the other hand, in the Democratic primaries, we see a range of, you know, we certainly see acknowledgement of the climate crisis and we see a range of ways to approach it, but I would actually argue maybe maybe a little bit provocatively that anything um any policy that is short of an aggressive and radical Green New Deal is a form of climate denial. Um, I mean, you might acknowledge that the climate crisis exists and say, I have these three policies to deal with it. But if the policies do not get at the depth of the problem, the acceleration of the climate crisis, the environmental disaster that we see all around us from wild, you know, from wildfires to flooding to sea rise, um, that are happening every day across the United States and across the world, if your policies don't, aren't aggressive enough um, um, and, and sort of at the scale of the crisis, then that's a form of denial of the, of the scale of the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's only Republicans that are, that are in denial. Um, so that, that's just one kind of, you know, overarching frame, but, but to sort of um, segue to your specific question. Yeah. So by, by, market-based um, or technocratic climate policies, we mean things like, for example, a carbon tax. Um, and we, in the book and in our other interventions that we made, we're not against a carbon tax necessarily. I th we think that a carbon tax, uh, can, which, is a, which is a tax on, on the amount of carbon emitted by you know, a given economic activity, can certainly play a role. But we see a carbon tax on its own as insufficient because if all you're doing is taxing individuals or corporations for the amount of carbon that their activities produce, but you're not actually publicly investing in um, creating a, a renewable energy system, in creating mass transit and green affordable housing, then you're not giving people, all you're doing is punishing people for what they do, and you're not giving people alternative m ways of living that are lower carbon. Um, so on its own, a carbon tax we think is useful, uh, for example, at targeting the worst emitters, right? So when we're thinking about um, fossil fuel companies or other types of companies whose, whose activities or, or extraction or production create a lot of emissions, certainly we want to find those companies. We want to, you know, we want to make them pay for their pollution. But when we're thinking about modifying individual behavior, especially among people that are working working class or middle class and don't have a lot of financial options to do things differently than the way they're doing them, then we need to actually publicly invest in creating a low carbon world together as a collective and democratic endeavor to actually change the way that we live. Um, so that's just, you know, I'm kind of answering both parts of your question at once, but just to give you a sense of, of the kind of policies that on their own we see as inefficient and insufficient and just too slow, like a carbon, you know, maybe there was a, a, a period, I don't know, a decades ago, where more kind of targeted kind of policies that sh shifted consumption towards lower carbon intensive consumption might have worked, but the crisis is way too deep. And we know that the causes of it are a kind of capitalist system that prioritizes profit and growth above everything else. And we know that at this point, we have no other option than to actually Actually, engage in social transformation um, and change our, our social relations, our relationship to the earth through massive public investment that that gives people um, the option of a lower carbon lifestyle. Because right now, many people actually just don't have the option to it. Like if you live in the suburbs, it's not clear, you know, how you can actually just shift your consumption because you live in a built environment that is. Um, from top to bottom, extremely carbon intensive. You live in detached housing. Um, the 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 um, your heat is is powered from let's say a gas plant. And your electricity comes from from natural gas. You drive your car to work. I mean, all of those have been shaped by policies that have incentivized an extremely carbon intensive lifestyle in the U.S. So in order to change that, we can't just like punish people with a carbon tax on each thing that they buy. We actually need to publicly invest in a different kind of world. Right. That's 
where, uh, you know, this, I, I love this entire argument because it really um, targets uh, the big missing link uh, in, you know, in, in, in terms of building, you know, a chain of activities that really uh, address the problem. And one of the disconnects, you know, we're talking about connected dots and everything, one of the big disconnects has been that we have been uh, habituated um, to look at ourselves, to look at our personal choices as consumers, to make those paramount, um, to give people instructions about how, you know, what they should do in this or that category, whether it's, you know, eating healthy food or being sustainable or whatever, um, you know, but without looking at the larger social and economic context of what's built out that you can access. Right. And so there's been this pretense right. that somehow we as individuals, you know, you know exactly. bad, bad you if we're not right, making the right choice, which really is a form of myopia of the larger, so, you know, economic context exactly. where, where there's, our, you know, as you point right. out, there's uh, government investment in the wrong kinds of things, and then mm-hmm. people are mm-hmm. individually uh, admonished or held to account, and, and in effect the carbon tax is, is continuing continuing the continuity of that same misguided uh, thinking and that refusal to really, um, you know, take the beast by the horns and, and, you know, said the day of, you know, the impeachment or whatever. But, um, (laughs) you know... And, and really, right. uh, you know, make, create a, a larger framework that actually supports and makes it possible even to do that. So I think that that right. particular, you know, and the other thing we see, I mean, at the climate town halls where the candidates, I was present at the CNN climate town, town hall where for hours, the Democratic Party candidates spoke on this topic. And, you know, there are simple buzzwords that come along with this technocratic approach. I trust science. I trust technology, which, of course, sounds, you know, quite uh, enlisting and seductive when you have, you know, a president who's in denial and doing great harm in the art environmental sector, you know, every facet of, of a healthy and, and, you know, stabilized environment uh, he takes aim at, right? So when somebody says then, on the democratic side, oh, I'm I'm looking, I'm trusting science. What science will come up with in the future, in terms of you know either technologies that will uh, you know in some way capture carbon or do other things, you know it kind of sounds appealing to you know an educated mind or the concept of an educated mind, but it really leaves large questions unanswered about exactly. You know how long it's going to take, what it's going to involve, because you know usually the carbon right. tax is the lead-in to some yet to be created technological solutions. Have you looked at the technological development side? I mean, is anything good? Yeah, in the offing, I mean, what, what kind of a pipe dream? Well, I, yeah, I, I have so many things to say. I'm going to keep myself short because uh, I know there's many more uh-huh. questions that you want to ask. But, but I just want to talk just for you know a moment about this kind of like believe in the science kind of thing. On the one hand, I completely agree with you that it kind of appeals to this like enlightened, you know, educated, affluent in a way. I think kind of uh, voters uh-huh. that like, oh, finally we're going to trust the science. Um, and, you know, so and, and I think that that kind of misses the politics of the matter, like what kind of political constituency do we need to actually assemble in order to get, cli- you know, aggressive climate policies uh, uh, implemented? And, and what are our real political and economic obstacles who are our enemies, who are our opponents, who are going to stand in our way? And I think we need to really think in deeply political terms about how to actually uh, meet the scale of this crisis. So that's that's one um, um, response that I would say. But the other thing I would say is that actually the scientists now, or at least the climate scientists that are writing these IPCC reports um, and, and other and other similar reports, um, are actually being quite radical. They're saying, you know, it's not just about, you know, I mean, if you trust the science, then it's not just about these minor policies. We need, like, total transformation. I'm quoting more or less directly from the IPCC report. So, you know, the scientists themselves are actually urging us to, to actually think much more systemically about about social change. And then if we think about history and how, how deep social change comes about, we know it doesn't happen by just technocratic policies or enlightened leaders. We know it happens from the bottom up and through exactly those types of coalitions that you were describing with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, sort of catching herself slightly off guard, you know, being asked by the Sunrise Movement to help 
occupy her boss's office, Nancy Pelosi's office, and put <laughs> pressure um, to get the Green New Deal on the agenda. And it's that type of coalition that is a combination of in, uh, grassroots social movements, of youth, of labor, of indigenous people, of people of color, um, of all sorts of people, you know, that I broadly would call the 99 percent, finding their insurgent left-wing allies in office that they can trust and that they also can will hold accountable when necessary. Necessary. Um, it's coalitions of that sort that are going to bring about the transformative change that we need, not some enlightened leader like waking up, reading a report and deciding to implement policies. So, so that's kind of just one set of answers to your question. And then, and then on the side of technological fixes, um, you know, if there were a technological fix, like, great. But the thing is that there isn't like a single technological fix for this for this problem. Um, there are certainly technologies that we need to deploy. Um, we obviously need to deploy a lot of, of renewable energy, right, and the technologies that assist in generating, capturing, and storing renewable energy, for example. Um, we know that we need to electrify transit. We know that we need to electrify our homes. We know we need induction stoves instead of deadly gas stoves, right? So, like, we need – we know that that technology is part of this, but there isn't a single techno fix. There isn't a single technological solution because the problem a because the problem is just too multifaceted and complex for there to be like a single techno fix um, but also because techno fix themselves can can like have backlashes. I don't know if you've seen the movie Snowpiercer, which is of course like a fictional movie, but in this wonderful cli-fi movie from a few years ago, uh, there's an attempted technical fix to, to like lower the atmospheric temperature by some kind of geoengineering and it totally backfires and they enter into an ice age. Ice age. Now, of course, this is like a fictional thing, but it, but it's illustrating a real point, which is that humans attempting to re-engineer the environment at a mass scale is obviously going to have all sorts of unintended consequences. So I also think that there's a danger in, in large-scale techno fixes, but I do think that there's obviously a role for technology to be deployed. Um, there, there's one last thing I'd say there, which kind of responds to another part of your kind of narrative of, of the, the climate town hall, which is that um, I'm also suspicious of candidates, um, um, some of whom might be candidates that, that have also some good ideas, but I'm suspicious of candidates that overly focus on research and development, R I, you know, i.e., you know, R&D, it's usually called in its shorthand. Um, not because I don't think research and development is important and not because I'm anti-technology. I'm not. In our book, we talk about all sorts of um, technological improvements that public investment could bring about. Um, but just because I think that sometimes that obstacle obfuscates a bit the fact that we actually have a lot of this technology. It already exists, and it's existed for decades. Um, you know, a solar panel, like there haven't been tremendous improvements in solar panels over the past decade or so. Uh, a lot of this technology is pretty tried and tested. Of course, there can be marginal improvements, but it basically exists. We know how wind turbines work. Like, we know how induction stoves work. We know how lithium batteries work. Again, all these things can be improved, but but the main issue is to deploy existing technology at a mass scale and make sure that it's affordable for people or free and, and make sure that there's a role for the public sector in it. It's not to like spend years to develop new technologies that it's not clear, you know, will actually help us. Um, it's to deploy existing technologies now and then, yes, continue to research and develop. Um, but but I don't I don't really like climate plans that forefront R&D. I like climate plans that forefront massive public sector investment in generating renewable energy and distributing it to everyday people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that, and I'm with you there. And, you know, to your excellent cautionary note about geoengineering, I mean, I also one of another area of my beat, my beat basically is, is the Green New Deal. You know, it winds up being the great part of, you know, important components of the Green New Deal because I also have reported extensively in food and food agriculture. So, you know, right. one could, and, you know, so then the question comes, what is a climate-friendly um, food agriculture? And so one can come with, you know, top down concept of, you know, ideally based upon certain criteria, this food or that food is, is good or better and this and that food is not. But then when you try to uh, engineer that out, it not only um, kind of erases um, local cultures, local climates, um, and, you know, Food is very much a ground-up, locally-supplied mm -hmm. endeavor in favor of some kind of mass 
um, you know, build out of uh, the favored foods, whatever they may happen to be, uh, you know, without good forethought about the actual, you know, that's another area of potential geoengineering um, where you also erase the unique roles of different landscapes and of diversity, um, you know, in, in, uh, on a healthy planet and on an ecologically stabilized planet. So, you know, we focus on these foods, and I'm going to eat this food or not, not eat that food. And we, you know, when we try to do this top-down design, that's kind of the same way we got into the problems. <laughs> we're into right. both in terms of how right. we supply energy and how we supply food and how we supply other things, you know, where it all becomes a kind of top down monopoly. Um, right. You know, I we're just... trying to, oh, sorry, I just want to say really quickly that that's something that we try to balance in the book, and it's a tricky balance, and there's not like a perfect way to do it. Um, but we're very mm-hmm. cognizant of this, of this sort of this tension, but also this potential kind of productive tension between planning and democracy, right? Between like plans that do need to be implemented and we do see a big role for the federal government and the public sector, um, but also for the importance of vibrant, um, uh, uh, kind of vibrant bottom-up mobilization, experimentation, democratic planning and consultation. So we kind of think about these two in tandem and yes, there will be tensions, but we also think that there's a lot of interesting kind of results that can come from, from a kind of bifocal vision where you both kind of have a role for the public sector and the government and the state, um, but you also have lots of room for social mobilization and local experimentation and see what kind of comes out of that. And a lot of what the public sector can actually do is help um, channel funding towards local initiatives, right? And so there are actually ways in which there isn't a trade-off where you can actually um, uh, channel the public sector to support local grassroots efforts, and then and vice versa, and build a kind of virtuous circle that way. Um, but I, but I, because I think your point is a really is a really good one um, about not, you know, we don't want to eliminate, you know, bottom up efforts here. We definitely want to think about how local democracy um, and and sort of massive planning can actually potentially work together. That's really a fascinating point, and I think one that um, you know, in in for the public, should be more uh, explicated and developed because um, you know I talk with you know networks in and 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 local endeavors in all of the sectors that we're talking about, and in the agricultural sector, you know I talk I talk to a lot of farmers, people in agricultural re- regions who are doing the kind of regenerative agriculture that is restorative to climate and produces healthier food, and you know. Tr- w- with some of them, I mean, when we talk about something like the Green New Deal and, you know, what that would look like and how it would um, su- support investment in what they're doing as opposed to these top-down monopolies that have actually uh, harmed the soil, causing desertification. They have been I- inhumane right. toward animals. They have been toxic with pesticides and, and all of that. Um, yet when you talk to people who are operating on a local level like that, they actually can't conceptualize that the government, a government investment could ever help them or ever rain down upon them, you know, in a, in a favorable way. I mean, you know, they, see, they, they immediately imagine that, um, you know, a, a government investment in agriculture, for example, would, you know, would be a monolith that would crush them. Mm-hmm. They, they can't mm-hmm. feature that it could be otherwise. You right. Know? Even when you point out some of the, you know, dimensions of the Green New Deal, you know, this specifically would economically support, uh, you know, people doing environmental work, far, you know, farming is an environmental right. task. Uh, you know, they, they, they just, they, they can't picture it after so many decades. So I think that's a really uh, important aspect of the conversation that should be more developed for the public so that people kind of, you know, begin to get, pictures and examples of that kind of nuance, because I I think, I mean, already the public is in favor of it, of the Green New Deal, but I think it would be even more popular and more engaging, and I realize also it's about the timing of how that gets built out. I wanted to backtrack to your earliest point in this last kind of round that we've been unpacking um, about politics, about the, because this is one of your specialty areas uh, and in your focuses, and, you know, and yet, like, you know, how politics is uh, kind of, 
for some people, a very simple-minded pursuit. For others, they're avoidant about it. Um, right. You know, what you mean by um, the uh, political influence on all of this and the need to kind of grab the steering wheel and steer, yeah. steer the bus in a different direction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and actually, this this circles back to some of your other questions about what's wrong with narrow, technocratic, kind of incremental approaches, which is that they generate no enthusiasm. I mean, there was kind of this this kind of uh, truism in a way for many years uh, that. I- myself kind of even believed uh, for a time period until I, I realized why it was wrong, that people just aren't interested in climate politics. It's too abstract. It's too technical, too scientific. It's too, like, global. It doesn't feel tangible. And, and, what, and, and you know, that's true, but that's true because of the way that climate politics were framed, which was in these really technical, abstract terms that didn't relate to anyone's everyday experience. But it turns out once you shift the frame, once climate politics becomes a sort of mass collective project for remaking our world to make it not just uh, safer for climate wise and, and less environmentally destructive, which are obviously very important, but also make it better in terms of people's um, you know, lived experience um, when we're thinking about providing housing and transit and renewable energy and, and not energy that pollutes, you know, local communities as well. Um, when you shift the frame of climate politics, which is what exactly what climate justice movements have been demanding for decades. So when you do that, you actually can generate mass enthusiasm. Like it, it turns out that climate, that the Green New Deal, both as a package, as a kind of paradigm or concept, but also its discrete policies are really popular. Uh, all the polling has shown that, that they're really popular, very popular among Democrats, very popular among young people, and even popular among, you know, across party lines to some degree, right? Especially if, 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 if kind of you, you kind of present individual policies, right? Because if a Republican is listening to Fox News all day, they're going to hear the Green New Deal and they're going to say, I hate it. But if you actually present some of the individual policies, like should the government invest in renewable energy or something, people like it, right? So actually the Green New Deal is, it turns out, much more politically popular. This idea that people couldn't be enthusiastic about climate politics, it turned out to be kind of a myth or at least predicated on this very narrow vision of what climate politics encompassed. Um, and so, yeah, as a political scientist, but also as a political activist and, and, a, and as you mentioned earlier, a member of DSA, I'm very interested in how do we actually build the coalition to win the Green New Deal. And what's so inspiring about the Green New Deal is the way it motivates people. And it's also the way that over time we can very much imagine it generating new constituencies. Um, in, in the U.S. And, and anywhere in the world, like once you have a policy in place that benefits ordinary people, I think of Social Security or Medicare, right? It's actually very hard to, to dismantle that policy. You know, as much as Republicans have tried to privatize Social Security, I'm not saying it could never happen. They, they have all sorts of dastardly ways of doing things, but, but it's, it's hard to do so with public support, right? And so we can imagine that if Green New Deal policies start to be implemented, right, if we start to actually build um, renewable energy that also creates lots of union jobs, for people. If we start to actually build green public housing or offer free retrofits for existing housing, um, if we start to build out mass transit for for areas of the country that have been deprived of mass transit options, if we start to actually do this, we can see the virtuous cycle starting where we actually kind of shore up constituencies, like politically organized and interested people that want to defend and maintain and also expand um, their new social rights, basically. There are new public welfare and social rights programs. So, um, so so that's kind of the politics of this. It's actually thinking about climate politics in an expansive way, in a systematic way that also addresses people's everyday concerns about how to pay the rent um, um, and how to pay their utility bills and all sorts of things. Um, and, and over time kind of broadens the constituency that will continue to not just vote for politicians that promise to implement Green New Deal policies, but also get out on the streets and mobilize for it, hold politicians accountable. Um, Because that's the kind of democratic politics that we actually need uh, in order to implement aggressive uh, policies on climate. Hmm. Wow. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, in light of that, um, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense. In other words, people seeing, you know, what's in it for them and in the same way providing things that actually people want but never thought that they were entitled to or could be helped toward that they absolutely need, um, you know, is actually a great way of uh, creating the buy-in and the push for this. And, of course, I have to add add my favorite hobby horse on this, which I drink. You know, I bring up with everybody all the time, um, uh, which is, you know, I, I see two two of, you know, my favorite fairies from, you know, the, the fairy tale or whatever, um, you know, that aren't, that aren't brought in uh, yet enough for my taste to all of these conversations about what a health-oriented, um, you know, kind of pro-humane society would feature for people, um, because with my background in, in both food and health, um, I see some critical missing links that really, I think, belong with this and that would be massive in terms of um, uh, their popularity and for enlistment, and that is... Uh, you know, we have a health care system provided through uh, the proposed Medicare for All, um, you know, that would give people a health safety net um, when, you know, severe health problems of all kinds strike, and that is certainly essential. What we don't have is a, um, a health promotion arm to that, where we mm-hmm. where people are, can more readily access healthy food, they can access community activities and soft touch e- efforts and and simple um, simpler kinds of basic diagnostics for identifying problems early and maintaining health. And there's a whole um, system of providing that, which is called integrative medicine. Um, unfortunately, the leaders of that movement who pioneer these techniques um, are many of them, not all, but many, are basically either neoliberal or libertarian, and so they basically pioneered these methods for the elites. And so they are only available to the elites because they're not covered by the health care system. Um, and then they're perceived as being an elite or, or snobby or only, you know, snobby people care about organic food. You know, it's like everyone, really. Health would benefit and well-being would benefit um, if everybody could access food that was grown without toxic poisons, you know, with the most nutrients in the best possible fashion. So when you talk about care, which is one of the fascinating features of the Green New Deal as you define it, the increase in Mm -hmm. caregiving activities, support for caregivers and caretakers, support for people, you know, who deal with pre-age, you know, with the elderly or with um, preschool children or, you know, um, like valuing caring work. Um, to me, this, this is a whole area of development for caring and for health um, that mm-hmm. would, all, both, you know, serve everyone and appeal to everyone because who doesn't want to have maybe some kind of support? So, you right. know, the, the, the healthy vegetable is not something um, you, can, you can only imagine and you're ordered, you know, offered it through a food bank, you know, some canned beans or something, and that's as close as you come to a vegetable. Or you're eating a pesticide-ridden vegetable uh, because that's all right. you can afford, you know, and you can't afford to get it too often. So I would love to see some of these pro-health things that have been pioneered um, be, be more available to everybody um, and right. and supported through the Green New Deal economy. So I'm just sharing that. <laughs> yeah, no, and we I, we emphasize care care a lot as as um, as a way to think about actually green jobs. Um, and and often, and I'm just going to sort of bring in this angle, and then maybe I'll address a little bit of the other things that you said around public health um, and having healthy choices more generally. Um, but one of the things that we do in the book is is really expand the notion of, of what is a green job, right? Which actually also expands the notion of what is a green community, right? A green job or green community is not just about building solar panels, as important as that is. That's the kind of general picture that comes to mind when we think about green work. Um, but we actually say that a big, part, a big way to think about green, green jobs and about, about what, what sort of low-carbon green communities would look like is, is caring communities and is caring work, right? And so we say that nursing, healthcare, elder care, teaching, 
childcare, all of these, um, a broad range of, of, of care work that we could already recognize because we already have it in our society, though it's often underpaid, obviously due to the fact that it's highly gendered and racialized work. Um, and also even care work that, that we don't have really much of in our society, but we need more of, you know, things like restoring ecosystems, right? And a, and a kind of new civilian conservation core uh, for, for the present day. So, so we have this really broad idea of green jobs as jobs that care for people, care for communities, and care for the earth. And, and we could see how that could really change community life. And then another thing that I just want to add, it's kind of little bit of a, of a hobby horse of, of mine, and it has to do with some um, um, issues that I've witnessed firsthand in my own family and in the communities that, that I live in, which is, you know, the extremely detrimental effect of isolation uh, on health, uh, social isolation on health and on kind of political life. Like the fact that we live, especially in, in suburban communities, in these detached houses and we, you know, drive to work alone and we spend time alone. And then as we age and if our kids don't take care of us, we sort of age alone and there's this big problem of elder isolation um, uh, yes. and it's and it's been linked in the in the health literature to really negative health outcomes like it can even like increase your likelihood of heart attack and, and even if it doesn't you know make your health worse if you do a bad health it makes it less likely that you're going to get the help that you need um, so I see social isolation as a big problem in our in our society and one that the Green New Deal as we imagine it would actually do a lot to help repair because a lot of social isolation comes from the way the built environment isolates us. The fact that as I said we live these isolated individualized privatized lives instead of a, a life of collectivity and togetherness and community, which the public sector through investment could help support, you know, whether it's through mass transit or affordable dense housing or more parks or more social activities, all of which have the amazing benefit or the two amazing benefits, one of like knitting together community and strengthening community and, and making people less isolated. But also these are all lower carbon because they're denser. They don't require as much distance traveled in a car. Um, they allow for more walking. Um, they allow for enjoyment of nature and of just like family and, and social relations, which, you know, just having a cup of coffee with a friend is not a high carbon activity compared to driving to a shopping mall and shopping. Right. So I think, you know, again, with your show theme of, of connecting the dots, like, the entire way that we organize our, our, our society has effects on the environment and has effects on, has psychological effects, has political effects, and, and we need to think in integral ways. And the, the last thing that I'll say is that social isolation is also politically um, very toxic because the more isolated we are, the more we are you know, prone to fear, um, to nativism, to xenophobia, um, to, to, you know, fearing change, um, because, you know, we're sort of holed up in our, in, in our little, in our individual lives and in our media echo chambers. And so we can really trace, I think, like the rise of the new right, the new right wing in the U.S. to this kind of extremely privatized, isolated kind of suburban and exurban landscape. We can see, you know, the clear connections, and that's where the voters for those types of politicians actually are. So I think that, you know, changing our built environment, generating and transforming and creating new types of communities that are low carbon, that are caring, that have public infrastructural and investment support, we could see all of the types of changes that that could bring about from the environment um, to, again, our individual psychology and health outcomes um, um, to kind of making more democratic and, and equal societies. That is absolutely fascinating. You know, you're really uh, including so many uh, intersecting things in, you know, in, in that systemic view where, you know, usually it's one specialty thread and then another and another, and the way they actually layer and bake into a cake um, that produces, you know, what we're seeing is rarely discussed. That's a fantastic um, integration, and I, I think we could do a whole show just on that, you know, unpacking that further yeah. because it's really hard for people to see it because it's the cake you live in, so to speak. I, you know, I'd say soup, but exactly. I just said cake. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really fascinating, and, and I, I just want to salute you and the other authors of this book um, because, you know, this is a whole new level of you know, this is a whole breed of journalists and academics and researchers and thought leaders and political activists who are really pulling stuff together and helping to integrate our understanding in these different frames so that we're not kind of stuck with a reductive, simplistic truism that's been around for a while but really hasn't helped uh, 
you know, us, it hasn't been a strong enough web to lift us out of this doldrum that we've been stuck in. And it's a doldrum of structure, and it's also a doldrum of mindset. Um, and the exactly. two function together. So I'd like to have you back and, uh, you know, unpack more of that conversation. We've been talking with Sia Rio Francos, one of the four co-authors of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. The other co-authors are Kate Aronoff, Alyssa Battistoni, Daniel Aldana Cohen, as well as Sia, um, who has just done a terrific overview of this wonderful book. And hopefully we will have more authors here on Connect the Dots. Um, I highly recommend that people actually read this book because it makes the hopes and plans, it gives a concrete, structured uh, envisioning of some of the key aspects of the Green New Deal, as we've discussed on today's show, um, you know, and, and it, so that, you know, as we look at the, the unfortunate climate trajectory that we're on, uh, it's really important to get a sense of what can and must change so that in the, on, you know, the coming political season, now as it is and into 2020, we're really prepared, um, you know, not merely to push back and defeat, you know, um, this anti-environmental and highly destructive um, overreach that we have in government now, but also to support the people who are really promoting a genuine change rather than merely play, playing a paying lip service and kind of moving around the pieces on the checkerboard in a way that will not really address the problem. I strongly urge listeners who've enjoyed this show to actually get hold of the book, uh, A Planet to Win, which is published by Verso Books. And uh, there ha because this is Christmas season, they're having a 50% sale. So this is uh, of this and their other books. So it's really a great time to go to their website uh, get a little holiday or post-holiday gift uh, and kind of uh, help educate and inform yourself and others um, by getting a planet to win why we need a Green New Deal. Also, um, we've done a whole series of programs here on Connect the Dots on the Green New Deal over the last year especially that it's been announced. Um, so if you go back into uh, the 2019 archives, you will find numerous show numerous programs and interviews with uh, with special guests who know about the economics of the Green New Deal, various other facets of the Green New Deal. We've been covering it consistently here on Connect the Dots and we'll continue to do so um, as you know as we go forward into 2020. This, um, if you've liked this show with the Rio Francos uh, or any of our other programs on the Green New Deal, please do share them in social media um, so that other people can uh, become better informed Formed as well. Um, I think it's really, you know, as we head into primary season and with just a few more debates, I think it's really essential for people, you know, to really understand the policies and the changes rather than just looking at personalities and, you know, who they like or imagine or are told by the corporate media might be electable. Um, and so I think we all have to up our game, uh, both in terms of our own knowledge of where we need to head as well as helping to bring along and inform others because um, anyone listening to the show is probably among the group that have the passion for this change and part of our job is bringing along other people who may not have time. Um, so I do invite and warmly welcome uh, listeners to do that. Um, also, as we look back over 219 and going forward to 2020, we also have numerous programs in the Connect the Dots archives on regenerative agriculture. It wasn't really much discussed in today's show, um, but it really is a key feature of climate restoration and drawdown as well as a healthy and uncontaminated food supply. And we've done numerous shows on regenerative agriculture with uh, agronomists and farmers and thought leaders in that area over the last three years, in fact. Um, so do look for those programs, too, and share them forward. I really appreciate your doing that. Like us on iTunes, of course. Um, and, you know, I just want to also take this moment as we're at the cusp 
uh, the end of our ninth year of Connected Dots and, uh, you know, launching in a week or so into our 10th year of the Connected Dots podcast. I just want to thank uh, all of you, my friends and listeners, for your support uh, of this show. Um, and, I, you know, because really it's, it's, it's the listeners and the guests who really keep the show going. Uh, we're going. We have some really. We've had a whole group of new crop of young and really brilliant journalists on the show this last year as well, discussing a wide range of topics. And we have other guests upcoming um, in 2020. That um, you know, I'm just uh, as a longtime journalist for decades. I really am so impressed um, with the new crop of journalists and reporters uh, who are, you know, doing the hard work in the trenches uh, on really, you know, in this time of of revelations about um, the tremendous corruption and systemic imbalances and inequities in our society, um, you know, which are heartbreaking to behold, um, you know, destructive in their effects. Uh, so concerning for the future of, you know, future generations of children and all life on earth, indeed. Um, You know, every day there's a a kind of a fresh uh, happening that is uh, disappointing, but they're, you know, and and indeed tragic um, that this has kind of evolved into this terrible, um, you know, kind of the generation of the social order. Uh, and with it, you know, the ecological order under our watch. But, you know, there are avenues for solidarity, uh, for redress, for restoration that we report about constantly over and over, program after program, on Connect the Dots. So it's really an opportunity and a kind of obligation, a duty really, to for those who care to be as active, as motivated, um, and is uh, involved in, in informing ourselves and sharing with others. And that's kind of, you know, my guiding ethos. Uh, and then hopefully if enough of us join the growing movement of solidarity for change, we'll be actually able to make the kind of changes we need to. You can find all of the programs that we have done over the last nine years on Connect the Dots online at Connect the Dots dot podbean, P-O-D-B-A-N, dot com, and you can search them month by month. Um, So, you know, I encourage and and warmly invite you to do that. I also share the shows on Facebook on Connecting the Dots for Health. Uh, That's my page, which you can sign on to that, Um, and as well as, you know, curating other uh, content, uh, policy-oriented content of the kind that we cover here on the show. So I want to thank you for uh, being with me. Uh, I'm Allison Rose Levy, and our guest this past year, and I look forward to continuing um, to share with you and exchange with you through different social media outlets here on Connect the Dots in 2020. Um, as I have, you know, said in many of the show salutations at the end, heads up, keep marching tall in company with all our relations. I wish you a happy holiday season and, and a good, you know, solid new year transition and look forward to being with you again uh, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time in 2020 and the coming year. I'm Allison Rose Levy. Well,